That's a Scott Mike Carlo to uh, facilitate uh, this panel here this morning. Originally, uh, Noala Eagle, who's one of the founders of Dakota Iapi Te Unkilapi Consortium in Chanupa Wakpa, Manitoba, was going to facilitate this, this session here, but, but she couldn't make the trip, but she was able to, to, to get the questions she wanted to ask to us. Mm -hmm. And so I'll be, I'll be doing that for her this, uh, today. I guess first, if uh, um, anyone would like to, I guess, make an opening statement or uh, elaborate on your introduction, or should I just get right into the questions? Okay. Um, the first question was, can you, please, can you please share with us what a successful environment for language fluency would encompass? Public, uh, public education, immersion, community programs. What would be the ideal environment to make those programs successful? And we can, anyone, if anyone wants to jump right in. I usually oh, talk on the radio. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Wana, <laughs> On Kamaji, Timai Hyun, Kadechawa, or Mas Abhema, you ha. Mija, I'm Bidu, Maji Bidu Hagash, Aka Dam Kicha, Oaki, Snitcha, Doina, Ed, Oewa to Mashni. As Hewaji Timai, you ha, you Gineka. Bata, O Data, Wogadak, Wogadak, is a speechia. Onganana, Ata, Hoshi, Shingada, Nogana, Ikduk, Eha, Tadina, me, are you a Please share with us um, what a successful environment of language fluency would encompass. Um, Yes, what's the ideal environment to create for a successful language program, whether it be in a school setting or immersion school? How can we best be successful? I guess I'll answer that first. I'll, I'll step forward and try to answer that. To, to my experience, to my understanding, in a successful environment, has not been created yet. It's in the works. Um, as long as we have non-Indian administrators in schools, we will always have a conflict with schedule. So it is important for community people, parents, to get involved and talk to school board members in terms of how that environment, that environment should be created so students can successfully learn how to speak Lakota. That's a, a quick answer that I have. Um, I'll try to give a quick answer as well. Um, last night I was going back towards the room and I was catching a ride with my sister. That's how I got here. And I was talking to her and I said, you know, I think what needs to happen kind of quickly is that when our kids go to school, 
from first grade on, all the way to 12th grade, they're being taught the white man's culture. They take English classes from first grade to second grade to third grade to fourth grade to fifth grade all the way up to 12th grade. They're learning English. They're learning how to read and write English. They're learning the grammar of English. They're learning the history of the white people, Europeans, you know, world history, U.S. history. They're learning geography, you know, how, how they conquered the land, how, who owns what, you know, what country is where, you know, and, and basically the culture of the Europeans and, you know, geography. Um, they're learning science from that perspective. They're learning everything. They're learning white culture, period, from first grade to 12th grade. So when they graduate from 12th grade, theoretically, they should know all about themselves and be comfortable with who they are. The only problem is, if they're Lakota children, you know, they're not gonna be comfortable with what they have learned for 12 years. So somehow, the if we're talking about an ideal environment, <laughs> you need to teach culture from first grade to 12th grade, not just language. You know, you need to teach Lakota song and dance, you need to teach traditional arts, you need to teach history of our Lakota from our perspective, you need to teach geography from our perspective, who owns the land, which land did we own, what happened to it, you know, things like that. You know, a total curriculum within the school itself, you know, to me that needs to happen. We actually tried that at St. Deglishka College. When it first started, all I was doing was teaching language. And I was visiting with, uh, at that time, before Lionel Bordo got there, uh, Jerry Mohat was director of the college. And I mentioned to him, I said, I'm kind of getting uncomfortable just teaching Lakota language at St. Francis Indian School. I wish I could teach Lakota song and dance, history and culture, you know, traditional arts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And here he hired me as director of Indian Studies of St. Deglishka College right on the spot. <laughs> so we introduced the, uh, the uh, two-year degree program in Indian Studies at St. Deglishka back in the early 70s when St. Deglishka first started. So we tried that. We tried to implement it. Politics got involved and, you know, all kinds of hassles, but basically, that's my answer. Scalata Immersion. The way which I keep the the wash which and the lila, which is it? It is very hard to be a Lakota teacher. Very difficult. Who ask? To how kikika the hand hit you? Now, I should ya. I want to command all the Lakota teachers to take the Lehan when the Lehan immersion of the Kakhtich. Nahakti Lila held the option. Nahakti Hakabel. We're just, when we get into immersion, we're just at the tip of the iceberg ahead. 
the environment of Kahanshtilila's environment. Now the environment here, when it Ganashna took tail, Lakhota ya be kile, Lakhota, Lewanske, Chaki, Kitala, Lakhoti. Now Mahana Lakhoti of the Shin. But Chamish here, there is no environment. Uh, environment kile atomans na yung laka ikansiwa nila malak hota cha uag lakin kita hanta na nakapi kila na tukahya lakhoti wainte ohetas es tahanas niya he wuyong reke watohan how do you create an environment? Which are very simply, when you're asked to speak, and they speak, if you speak the Lakota language, use it. Tokai. And when you do that, then you create that environment. But it's not going to be a total environment because you're going to use English to explain yourself, to explain what you're, you said. It's a hey environment. When I emerge in Kile, it's up to the students. And it's up to the teacher. And it's up to the student to learn. If they want to learn, they will learn with the teacher's help. <clears throat> and then the teacher is the motivator. And the teacher has to be, uh, when. Uh, they mentioned my Tushka uh, Peter Hill up here. We always use two words, commitment and persevere. But Chumhata, if you do it once a week or once a day, it's going to be very difficult. That's part of it. But uh, it's going to be really challenging. And <clears throat> the question up here is someone mentioned uh, the children. When I was with the Law Lakota College, uh, Mr. Shortwood asked me one day, how many children do you think speak the Lakota language? So I said, you know, I've been to Eagle Butte on the Cheyenne River Reservation. I've been to here, I've been here for many years. I have been to Rosebud, Standing Rock. And I have run into maybe three that speak Lakota. That's not too many. So it's, it's going to be very difficult, because, but it can be done. It can be done. Someone mentioned Okichapi, Ihaki Chiktapi. You have to work together and work and in one direction. And that was mentioned this morning too, the keynote. My brother from Jima Ka mentioned that. Work together and it's going to work. And that's Kanashi uh, and I, when we, we've been doing the radio show for seven years, over seven years now. 
You know, we, the, all those Lakota words that we use, sometimes I, I sit there and wonder. Uh, there's some that I don't know. He just asked me one that I don't know. So I learn every day of myself. I learn from all of you, all of the teachers, everyone that speaks Lakota. I learn. And the Lakota way is very important. And yesterday at one of the uh, sessions, um, someone mentioned the question was, can you separate culture and language? When you teach the language, you communicate. You talk to teach the language. The language is the culture. Culture is language, language is culture. So you cannot separate them. You teach the culture with the Lakota language. So I'm really proud of these uh, young people that speak Lakota. And I'm very proud of the uh, Porcupine Head Start Immersion Project through the Wa Lakota College. Because I have witnessed three-year-old stand up and tell his name, his age, where he lives in Lakota. And today that little, those little children are pre-kindergarten. Uh, and those kindergarten students can stand up and if you ask them in Lakota, they'll answer you in Lakota. So I truly believe that someday if they keep going, there's going to be Lakota speakers. And before I, I leave, I'm on the uh, Ryan here. Him and I uh, have been to Lakota um, revitalization projects. What is language revitalization and preservation? in five years, 10 years, 20 years from now? La kotia shna wagalaka na ha ohis kosko shna wagalaka. No chai washichi wa chan lila chep chebe la shna wagalaka. Eun washichi wa ele. Echel da nai. What I've uh, just said is uh, that if I speak Lakota, I can speak three days. But if I speak English, I can only speak uh, less than five minutes and don't make sense. Um, I think. Revitalization is a good thing. And it's always important to, to think positive. And uh, I just want to re relate a, a uh, story to this and then that'll be my answer. In the uh, military, when you go into the military as a Native American or Lakota person, you end up being the only Indian. So you get all kinds of names. But the, the comparison in education is at the administrative level, if you're Indian, you're the only one that's up there. Because there are a lot of situations that we need to understand. And uh, the first one is, is the system is oppressive. Uh, it's guided by external policy, rules and regs, and the funding 
it is coming from the federal government but handled by the state. And that's, that causes some problems. The system is also suppressive, very suppressive. Uh, relevant research is not allowed and local knowledge isn't part of the curriculum. Just to mention uh, some things, there's more, but with the time, time constraint, then there's discrimination. Certification is very discriminative for Lakota communities, particularly reservation, who have their own sovereignty. And I've heard someone talk about freedom, and what does that mean? So certifications, the tribal governments use state certifications or other external entities who, who do that. Praxis is another thing, praxis testing. And so what happens is we have barriers, we have, we have opposition. And so, you know, we can revitalize, but we have to sit down and talk about strategy. How are we going to do that? How are we going to get the right people into the systems? And by allowing this OSD system, by allowing it and Continuing to use it, we perpetuate this myth of of uh, failure because you know the testing companies; those are also oppressive. They're not designed for us Native Americans, Lakota people. So there's a lot of things that we can we can do that to overcome within five years within. The next five years, we have to deal with ourselves as to what we want our education to look like, because we're going to argue about that. Some will not want what is termed Indian education, true Indian education. So we'll have to go through that storm. And then within 15 years, we will probably create that atmosphere of revitalization. So we have a lot of work to do. And we also have a lot of successes on our reservation. One example is Red Cloud School, the immersion schools at Head Start. And we have a whole bunch of teachers who have certification, but they don't receive the funding or the, the salary that that is equal to a four-year teacher. So there's a lot of uh, situations, and I think it's possible. That's how I would uh, answer that question. Uh, Pilama uh, Thank you. Language revitalization in five years. Again, just going back to my same point. <clears throat> Kids today, even though they go into the classroom speaking English, they take English classes. First grade, they take English in second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, all the way up to twelfth grade. They're learning English. In five years, even if we get our kids to the point of speaking Lakota, we need to keep teaching them Lakota in first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, all the way to twelfth grade. But in order to do that, we teachers have to learn about the structure of our own language. And we shouldn't limit ourselves as to how we should learn that. 
I waited for 40 years for somebody, a Lakota person, to sit down and explain the structure of the Lakota language to me. Nobody ever did. I had to go to professional linguists to do that. So I went to them and I learned it. Okay. So in five years, every single Lakota language teacher should, if whether they learn it from linguists, wherever they learn it from, be able to sit down and explain the Lakota language, the structure, the grammar, the sound system, the semantics, the syn uh, syntax, you know. Be able to do that comfortably without any problem in five years. And after five years, they should be in that classroom teaching those kids the same stuff after they start speaking the language. I keep telling people, you know, Lakota kiha, Lakoti onkile, the structure of the language, Lakota language, does not have tense. English, when you learn English grammar in high school, in grade school, you found out that there was tense. Present tense, future tense, past tense, past participle, dra, 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 there's about 15 different tenses. English has tense. You know, over 2,000, 3,000 years, it, tense, which means time, got incorporated into the structure of the English language. There's no tense in Lakota. So how do you explain it? That's a challenge to the teachers. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> what is language revitalization in five years, 10 years, 20 years revitalization and preservation? Who can use English grammar as literature? <laughs> I took uh, Bonehead English in college five days a week. And I'm still having trouble with verbs and pronouns. And, you know. uh, the answer to that is yes, five years. The one that uh, started at the college is going to go Last I heard, and uh, um, I was part of that, and go well, five years, they're making a new building. And our vision, our dream is to go up to 12th grade immersion and keep going until everybody speaks Lakota, all our children speak Lakota. It's possible. Omi taku yapi, ma shichu i choye, e ap cha a ta taku wo kok pa kaps techa. They want another language preservation and uh, revitalization. Now, ma enemy and now we choye taku kaps. E preservation, e ap he owaka ni ragekta taku toke toke du hantash heche na hikta. You preserve food out. Chamana de taco and a hitch in a hink top. Hey, quack and a checha kichamis a tea, hogashina, onchi, bog laka bekta, toge ke bichoye umpi. Chi had chabag me of an old money, yechinka yanka yukeshni. Naha, I can't turn a lach umpi, you crash me. We march in the Nagha and Toka, I can't turn a one up umpi, Toka wam daka. Chataku hena ehani, so preserve ebe, he washed in a quapi kechamisa. Gash de revitalization. Mana de hand doke ke umpi, hena 
ikhaya gonya pikta onko ki hipika chame mashi chuta ko kaga bena ata wo kopat hekhira ba hena dina o kah ni shi chake chime she chutushne na ko wog da ka bekta de toshka ben he tuk de taku ko hechel hea gash da kho da ki wog da ka piki ata dina shmaya wog da ka pe na hena o kah ni rapi na da khori api hena o kah ni rapi chai chu go ki hi pe ke chami de na ta ku ka ga pe ki na ta ku na shne na china na ku o chiwa wa cha ka ka pe aka ni aka chishni to ke ke guna na he makan ma king ta et but you know hena ta ku na shne he o chu go ki hi pe ke chami if i could uh just expand on also what our elder was talking about that that word is very dangerous uh, preservation it's a very dangerous uh, to me it's a ugly word too you know and uh you know, maybe we could just throw that out all together because uh that's not our goal you know it's to make live again and to um make real again and to revitalize and 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 the thing i said the other day was our our tribe The Oglala Sioux tribe is 44,000 members in our tribe. If you look at all the Oglalas that are married into other tribes, maybe they're not enrolled or maybe there's pending enrollment, there's probably another 40,000 Oglalas around the country too. If we only have several hundred speakers left, we have to look at 99% of our population aren't speakers. So that's where the word revitalize comes in. And as, as the years go on, no matter how fast we work or accelerate these efforts um we're not going to be able to keep creating speakers as fast as we're losing speakers so this ratio is going to become very imbalanced but if we act now just as Brian was saying with this immersion school um every reservation that still has a critical mass of speakers should be trying to create this preschool immersion with the idea that they would build levels age levels on on to it and um and that can happen in the next year i i firmly believe that i don't think that's an outrageous uh, thing to say if we're able to do that in the next year in five years we'll have a fifth grade in this immersion think about that now and this um this language that we're all making fun of and 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 what not uh, english um it's it's a language that doesn't have a father it's a um it doesn't have a origin it's a um combination of a bunch of european languages it's almost like our uh, our our cherished dogs on our reservations these resmuts you know it's that's what it's like and uh it's fun when we butcher it cuz it gets our european american brothers all excited when we butcher it you know they get all offended but it's it's not a proper language and and i always think when our um when it becomes central in our minds and and it made me think about this today when this word freedom you know what does that mean and and what is it for us to recapture original thought recapture original mind and how do we do that and that revitalization goes hand in hand with that and this this uh, occupation of our homelands the illegal occupation of the lands here and in other parts of the country there's legal occupation but it's the occupation of our homelands we have to really think how are we coexisting with this occupation and if you look at what's happening with our young people just as these youth were talking about we're not coexisting very well and this english language it does it makes you think different and it's almost um i almost equate it and I, i i said this one time and it, it got everybody all excited but it's um i say it because i lost my mother from cancer and when she had cancer she had to put another poison inside her the doctors to stop that other poison that she already had that was killing her and everybody knows what that is when you're going through treatment with cancer it's chemotherapy radiation it's another poison and it's almost as if this occupation's never going to end our uh, relatives aren't going to go back to europe they're going to be here forever 
We have to almost accept English like, a, like that poison to help coexist. At the same time, we have to accept as well, if we don't create a critical mass of our own speakers, and I, I even see a day, maybe even our chairman might even be a single speaker, maybe just our language is all he'll speak, or our chairwoman of our tribe one day down the road. And that'll be just fine. That's not gonna hurt us. It's gonna be just fine. So this revitalization in five years, if we start these schools in the next year, we're gonna be all that more ahead in five years. In 10 years, we're gonna have children that have been exposed to our language for a decade. Think about that now. In 20 years, a lot of us in this room aren't gonna be here no more. But if we do our work now, it's almost like planting seeds or planting a tree that's going to grow. And so that's, that's kind of how I would answer that question, Mike. Thank you. Sovereignty, the freedom um, have all been brought up or talked about throughout the, the summit here. And, and Ryan just talked about uh, you know, our, our tribal one day having maybe our tribal chair being the last speaker. But uh, last year for the summit, we did invite you know, all the tribal chairmen, tribal presidents, and, and chiefs to talk about what our elected leadership's role is in language revitalization. And I guess I just want to put that question uh, to, to, to you on the panel. What is, does our, our tribal governments what is their role in this? How can they how can they help? I have a little trick that capital. Um, I don't know how I can answer that very quickly. Uh, our tribe, tribal chairman who's sitting right now, uh, when he first got in, he created an office called Lakota Language Preservation Office. And um, needless to say, they're still struggling to figure out exactly what their direction is. But his intention was to, for the government, tribal government, to be involved in reviving the Lakota language in the communities. You know, he said there are, it's already happening in the college and in the schools, school systems. Now he wants to take the language out to the communities. And, and try to uh, uh, revitalize that there. So I was one of their first teachers. We taught for 10 weeks a Lakota language class uh, in Rosebud. We had several students. The only problem is when you, when you open a class to a community, you don't know who's gonna show up. You, know, you get five people show up, and then the next week, a different five people show up, you know? <laughs> so it's kind of hard to structure a course, you know, throughout a period of time. But anyway, my sister, Sandra Blackbear, works there right now. And uh, so that was their intention. And the other intention of the education department is to support the schools. You know, St. Davis County University is in Rosebud, uh, St. Francis Indian School, Todd County School, and then try to encourage, you know, how can the tribe support the teaching of the language in those schools politically? You know, can they you know, pass resolutions or, or help them get funding, you know, to get Lakota language teachers? You know, how can the tribe support uh, those different schools in their effort to try to teach the language? So that's another aspect of what they're trying to do. And um, so I, I'll just close here. I, I don't know if Sandra's here. Um, she's the only right I have, so she better be around. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm walking. <laughs> Yeah, we talked a lot about the Kina. Hey, Takoja, we all be attacked here. Wahupa goes at Hawakunzeki, 
，阿不勒索起我，我一打过卡一只，我还哈，我还跌我五一个钟，那哈个只，干不勒索不是，没这个只说啊是，还要干别的，打过我不勒索。There are a lot of information that that Lakota people have that is considered very deep, and and there is also some things that are superficial. And the current system that governs our lives as on what we call reservations, I'm not so sure if. They understand, but if if they did, they would strengthen govern govern government to government relationships, and they would dissolve any dealings with the state, or they would act sovereign and tell the state, it is time. It is time for you, as a state entity. To start working with us and give us the opportunity to create the improvement plans, because for over a hundred years your improvement plan has failed. Uh, it's kind of radical, but I think that that's the attitude. That's that's where we need to be. And our federal and, and our tribal government and representatives and leaders need to begin that journey, if that's the journey that is going to be taken. Wahe ha, lai pinte la. Miguelu chanza ke hanta hi, vastek tashme. My cousin said he's radical. All these years um, that I've been doing the radio shows with him, um, I'm usually the radical, and he's the he tells the good side. So, uh, and then when it comes to a question like this, uh, especially when it gets into uh, politics, I use this word uh, skirt. I usually skirt that question. I go around it. I don't get involved in politics, especially when it comes down to our language. And the language, uh, all of you are leaders in here. It's your language, and it's really up to us. And there's only really one word that uh, I always hear when it comes down to doing something. Doing something that you can see uh, results or see the light, and that's support. If we don't support each other, or if we don't have that support to revitalize this language, whether it be the president, or chairman, or you, or me. It's up to us, everybody, the teacher, the school, the administrators, the community people, parents. It's up to us. And I, we always use that word support. And I think um, when it comes down to revitalization, it's teamwork and patience, a lot of hard work. They are Kewi Choya, Majia Ubna, at a Kehe Woke of Pe, Kia Woke of Pe, get a Okahni Hapina Checha. Get chummies up. The dog on a sovereignty up. Head, head to our head, head to uh, Okahni Hapiki, to wake it ash, dark docket, or peach up till Oichaki, a governor, head to um, 
אמרנו לי צ'אגה בהצ'ה דצ'ונטה, הצ'ה לא כך נראה בי כצ'ה מגש. ‫אמנה העוד חוקה, ‫תיאת האלי צ'ויה, ‫ואמרו לי אוכל שקט, ‫תחוקה שלנו על... ‫קלן את שיאת ההן, ‫תחי הנאום, ‫נינטינוואן היה תחום ב... ‫נאום שפיה את שיאת ההן דגוע, ‫שהיה דגו כאות הבלזה, ‫דגו כאות המקר. ‫אז את שקדת, דרך וצ'וי, ‫אמרתי, אתה דואג אלי, ‫אש היה לך סוברטי, סוברטי. ‫הייתה כל כך הרבה. ‫מה, אמרת לך כל זה, ‫הנה, מי זה בדיוק צ'ה. ‫אש דאר כל כך הרבה, ‫כי הם איגדו הרבה, ‫הרבה, הם שכך הרבה. ‫שאנחנו הנה מג'יב וצ'ה, ‫הוגיע בי, הרבה. ‫נהל הוגית הרבה. ‫הנה איכוי הגגצ'אמי. ‫נא איו הנא האויו הבי. ‫נא דוקת גאה יוה שגיאו גיג'י הבי, ‫כי הא נגעו האו גיטה הבי. ‫נא דאגו ואנדינה אווה בדזס אה. ‫דאגו וצ'וטי גגדה. ‫או כניש אותה בשנינה צ'צ'ה. ‫גש ושיצ'ו גידקו ‫ארכי תשובה הד וגיז'ה הד ‫שקעון שיפי. ‫גש איהני וגיד שווה בגיה דואני דקו הגן, ‫אב גן כך יא. ‫וצ'ה אום שני. ‫דוע דת שדוע דק דוק קונצ'י הנטש ‫את שום אלא דוע דת שאוקי אוקיפי. ‫דואן הדק יא שני. ‫אש דהן יהיו הנפתיינה ‫שקום בהד של ויצ'ה קוואבי, ‫הד שאו דאקו נא את שום גוקי היא בשני. ‫נא דאקו לי אבי, ‫כי צ'או היה בי כדאה, ‫שאם היה הוא בי, ‫חד שקי. ‫נא ונא אוהב חנום, ‫אוהב חטוב ה, ‫דאקו לי היה קאבי. ‫ואנא תיאטה, כי הכי גדל, ‫בוצ'וטי תחווה בגדל. ‫דפורוי הגבי, כי הנה מזסקה ‫אותה יוהבי, ‫הנה אחד, הנה גנגי, ‫הנה ויהיו פיקבי, ‫שתועד הנה עובו גדל, ‫כבדוק את קצ'ו, ‫בגד אוגי בגד שמי. ‫או אף חנום או אף חטוב רוג דקה ‫בגלל הכיתה, ‫ואחרי רוג דקה שלי נגעו, ‫וואג יוז'אז' אבי אמפטו, ‫נאמפטו זבתא רוג דקה שלי. ‫הנה ההד שתו שני, ‫הד שאו דיה רוג דקה, ‫אוקיב שני, נהכתי. ‫אש הנה מזסקה אליה, ‫נהה, הנה וואיו פיקה בי. ‫אקספרט, פרופשנל, ‫ואנא אחרי ראשית של ביצ'ו יהיה אבצ'ה. ‫הנה מאז עסקה אותה ריצ'ק אופי. ‫גש דנא איז'ה הצ'ה ביצ'ה, ‫הנה ריצ'ק תשובה, ‫דנא אוספה בי. ‫דוקת גשקם תהנדש, ‫הנה או ריצ'ק יבנא הצ'ה, ‫ואנא מורה אוקי בינא צ'ה צ'ה ביק, ‫הנה וקחה איז'ה אוב אובה, ‫ווג דג יקה בווג דקה ביקתא. ‫ווד יקה בנא ווג דקה ביקתא. And that to me would, would be like a dark immersion cup. That head should do it. I mean, a head should do it. I mean, a head should do it. So, I mean, 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 ‫אז אוי נא הד של בי. ‫נא דה מג'ים נגעו את שוי הפרידם. ‫מי הפרידם? ‫או רק כך נראה אבדיה. ‫גש דואנה איו דייק יא ריצ'ק יא בשני. ‫נא דואנה יא או יא זא ריצ'ק בשני. ‫הא אוגה אבדיה אום ראשתה. My dad asked me to help with the Northern Arapahoes, um, with the Council of Elders there. We had a wonderful relationship with the Tribal Council, the Northern Arapaho Business Council. And we had two of them that were on our uh, board of directors, so to speak. And uh, we negotiated 
to take over the old TANF building on the Wind River Indian Reservation there, and then we renovated it with uh, tarot, uh, tarot dollars and the um, commercial construction training program for some of the young Arapaho boys on the uh, Wind River Reservation there. We also worked with the tribe to negotiate the return of 10 acres of land from uh, St. Michael's Catholic Church in Ethity, Wyoming there that they returned uh, for us to build this cultural heritage center eventually. And we worked with the tribe to approach a private foundation called the Lannan Foundation. Um, and so we had to demonstrate tribal support for what we were doing. They were very interested in knowing what the elected leadership thought of what we were doing. So we had this very strong, very powerful relationship with our elected leaders. But guess what? You know, they change every two years. Uh, just like we have in Pine Ridge, every two years there would be a whole other crew in uh, after the election next year. And um, this is so it goes. And the new people came in, they thought they had better ideas what to do with the money. They um, thought they had better ideas on how to handle their fiscal oversight of what we were doing. And it's turned into uh, a difficult thing to straighten out. The money's gotten commingled. Uh, we don't exactly know what's in there, what's out, and that's because we were relying so heavily on the elected leadership and our partnership with the tribe. Um, and it's one and the same. The Council of Elders is a part of the tribe. The tribe's the governing body. And here we talk about tribal sovereignty, but if you're a community-based organization, at some point, at some time, you have to have a relation with the elected leadership. So. That's still yet to be resolved, but it taught us a lesson that we had to establish our 501c3 and that we need the support of the tribe, not the management of the tribe. Not their oversight, but their support and in partnership. And, uh, and we're still working that out and it's, it's not easy. It's actually, uh, um, it's difficult. But if I, was, if I was to do it all over again, we would have worked harder to get that nonprofit status and then tried to just be partners with, with the elected leadership instead of um, almost one and the same. And that was a real valuable lesson we learned. And the building that we renovated, they even put another uh, program in there, our vo voc ed program they put in there, um, which is occupying uh, part of our building. And it was very frustrating to us because we had expansion plans. We were gonna have a uh, daycare for babies and. We had all these things that were in our strategic plan, um, but they went ahead and did that. And so, um, and, and I'm friends with that council, I'm just saying it because it's the truth of what happened. If we could do it all over again, we would have put that in the contract. We would have worked harder to have a 501c3 to try to maintain some separateness from them. But at the same time, if I was president of the Oglala Sioux tribe, you know, I would make, <coughs> language issues the highest priority because it's an intellectual sovereignty issue as well. It's a wellness and health issue. And, and the, um, the fight we get in about IRA governments versus traditional governments, it, it needs not be that. We can have both. We could respect both. And we can have you know our elders, we could have these people that still hold these ways um, be a part of this decision making too along these lines. We could strengthen our education codes. The Northern Arapahoes, we worked on our education code and language is a big piece of our code. Also, we asserted the right to run our own schools within our education code. The Rosebud Sioux Tribe put an education code in 20, 25 years ago. The Oglala Sioux Tribe is still working on it and still having great debate about it but you can strengthen it through those codes. We all have planning departments, grant writers. You can direct those planning departments to assist with the language efforts as well. And we have all our leaders are always scrambling. You all, every time you see a plane flying somewhere, you know they're in it. They're going to DC and back and forth, whether it's housing, law and order, you know, water issues, all these issues how come language can't be right up at the forefront as well? It ought to be. And it's just as crucial as any issue uh, for us. And so as a, as a leader, we can prioritize those things. We can do that. We can turn a new page. But we have to figure out how to partner with the tribe without having them usurp control and jurisdiction. Because their, their role is to run a nation and to nation build. 
not micromanage, not micromanage. And um, sometimes they get confused in that role as well. And they get caught up in personnel issues. They get caught up in all these things. Next thing you know, you might have a, someone on there that has a relative that they want to have run the language department. Or they have a, an individual that they owe a favor to that they might want to have force them on the immersion school to work in there and that person can become disruptive. Um, I fired several people. Drugs, alcohol, insubordination, not coming to work. And then I've been directed to rehire them again. Does that sound familiar to everybody? Or? Yeah. And um, so these are the things. It's strengthening governance, responsible governance, and it's creating inclusion for the speakers, the elders, our ceremonial spiritual leaders to help you know, push these things forward, but not usurp and not take over. And uh, that's kind of how I would see it you know, with uh, elected leadership. I think you'd like to, to thank the panelists for, uh, for sharing with us. Before uh, we stop, Daku and Pawa Ching, one of them mentioned, yes, we have hope at home. Tiata Dukdekdit Dayash Gampi. Na Oak Pamli Chik and Akitab Noom Ed, Wayawa Tiu Hapi. Wakbana Wakbala Eb. Heta Kuku Dayai Chumpi Gichami. The Little Eagle School. We have, I think, some beginnings there in the uh, elementary and the, uh, and the high schools that we have at Wakbala, particularly. So we're very happy to see some beginnings and we know that they will move forward. Thank you. Uh, please give our panelists a, a round of applause. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much for, for sharing. I know we, we've all had a lot of walking these last three days, and, and we just need to make that trip one more time. We're gonna we're gonna go down to the other end, and, and we're gonna share we're gonna share lunch again, and, and we will do our closing for this year's summit. <laughs>